Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK? Great. Thank you so much for attending. I honestly mean it. You know, I'm talking about mental health can be very vulnerable, and you never know who's going to be in the room. Um, so it's really nice to see this audience here. Uh, as Ingrid mentioned, my name is Jamie Wu, and I'm here today to talk about what I consider the unmonitored failure domain, mental health. Oh. All right, so we're going to start with story time. So recently, I had to write a goodbye email as I left uh, my job to take a sabbatical. Uh, and we've all read goodbye emails. And many of us have written goodbye emails, You know, uh, probably written more than a few. And goodbye emails tend to have similar beats. You thank everyone. You say that you've learned so much. Uh, you've met some amazing people, uh, that you treasure your time, but you found an opportunity that you couldn't turn down. And so you're off. And you hope everyone keeps in touch, right? Uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, usually those beats do truthfully cover much of what people are feeling. And it's understandable that people want to leave on hopeful, inspirational messages. I can already see all of you, you're like, where are you going with this? What did you do in your message? Um, I'm just pointing out that I enjoy the familiarity of goodbye emails because they're kind of like the french fries at McDonald's. They're reliably similar wherever you go. So when it came time for me to write mine, I had one written in exactly that same way. Thank you all. I've grown in my time here, and so on. But then I remembered something uh, that a friend of mine had mentioned to me a while ago offhandedly. He said that he really liked someone else's goodbye email because it detailed some of the early history of the company we both worked at, and he learned something from it. And so I deleted my email. I decided to start from scratch. I thought to myself, if I had a chance to write something to the entire company, what would I want them to learn from my email? Uh, and so this is my email, or part of it. Um, and at the time, I was starting to feel the effects of burnout. Uh, I'd read story after story about how pervasive burnout was, not just across all jobs, uh, but also specifically in tech. So I thought the most useful thing that I could do was be vulnerable and acknowledge my feelings of burnout and provide some resources. I wrote, even if you're not experiencing burnout, there might be a day when someone you know is, and it's great to know how to help. So I wrote this email knowing it was unconventional, but I listed some resources. I listed a quiz that you could take to look at your burnout, um, just in case someone else out there had been feeling it. And I was blown away by the support I received from my coworkers afterwards. You know, many of them had this feeling as well, and they didn't know if they were the only ones. I think that's the most frustrating thing about mental health issues, is how alone we can feel in them, how isolated we can feel in them, how we feel that we're the only ones who might be suffering it, and we're so scared to mention it because we don't want to be the only ones who are suffering from it. I think that honestly stinks, because my colleagues like their jobs. You know, burnout doesn't mean a job is bad, but it does mean we need to be open enough to pay attention to it so we can make things better. We need to talk about what factors play into mental health so we can put as much intention into designing uh, our SRE roles as much, or to make them as resilient as our systems. So I just want to start the talk with a bit of intention. So today we're going to dive into the research around work-related stress to learn about how it affects mental health and apply some ideas from our industry toward improving working conditions for our coworkers and for ourselves. Let me start by saying, what do I mean by mental health? This talk really is focusing on work-related mental health. I'm talking about the stress from our jobs that can lead to anxiety, mood disorders, and burnout. You know, this obviously is not an exhaustive look at mental health. Uh, and so serious and important parts of mental health, such as dementia, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, are not within my scope. I can't, and I'm not going to speak about those issues, because I don't really have much knowledge of them. So moving on, let's start with a broad snapshot. Uh, this is from the American Psychological Association's 2016 Work and Wellbeing Survey. Overall, most employees, 82%, say that they are in good psychological health. However, nearly one in six employees say that mental health problems made job challenges more difficult to handle. 
And I don't know if it's very easy to read, so I'll actually read out the questions here. So the first one here is under stress. During my workday, I typically feel tense or stressed out. Now, they broke this down by age category. Uh, so the dark green bar are people aged 18 to 35. Uh, the middle bar is 36 to 51. And the bottom bar is 52 to 70. And almost half of people 18 to 35 felt stressed on a daily basis. Under physical health, it says, during my workday, I experience physical symptoms such as shortness of breath, dizziness, muscle spasms, headaches, and neck stiffness. And the reason why I put this slide up is, as I'm mentioning it, just think about your daily routine, and maybe if you feel any of these things. Here, one in four uh, people 18 to 35 responded that they do. Uh, about one in six for people 36 to 51, and one in 12 for people who are 52 and older. And I think you'll see this pattern where uh, the numbers tend to decrease as people get older. And I, they don't really give a lot of reasons for that. Uh, they actually label each of these uh, ages through their generation. So that top one is millennials. And I know we have all these like, ideas of what millennials you know, think or do. But I think it might be because uh, they're newer in their careers. And maybe they've got more things going on at the same time. Uh, maybe they're just not um, as uh, comfortable in what they're doing yet. Maybe they have new challenges that they're tackling. There's a lot of reasons. I don't think that's just because they're millennials that they're feeling this way. Uh, they could be more self-aware about what they're feeling. That could be a huge thing, especially as we are now destigmatizing the idea of mental health. Under mental health, it says, in the past month, the challenges of my job were harder to handle because of mental health problems, such as depression, anxiety, or other medical health issues. And again here, we've got somewhere between 16 to 28% for people ages 18 to 51. So this isn't, um, this isn't a, a you know, small problem. This isn't something that if you feel it, you're alone in. This is something that's quite pervasive. Uh, for the last one, in the past month, mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, or other mental health issues kept me from achieving my goals at work. And there, again, one in four for people who are 18 to 35, one in seven for people uh, 36 to 51, and then 6% of people 52 to 70. And of course, this, um, this doesn't mean that these numbers directly apply to SRE. I want to be very careful here, all right? So rather, I just wanted to paint a picture that this is something worth describing or discussing because it is widespread. So how does stress actually happen? And this was really interesting in doing the research, is that researchers actually broke down the ingredients for stress. They found that there are four universal ingredients for stress. In ingredients makes it sound really delicious. Um, I use it because I, I love food, but I don't actually think these are particularly yummy. Uh, but the four are novelty, unpredictability, threat to the ego, and sense of control. Now, it doesn't mean that when you're stressed, you're going to feel all four. You're going to feel at least one, and maybe a combination of more than one. Uh, I think the ones here that uh, maybe just I'll read out the emotions. Threat to the ego is just that your competence as a person is called into question. We feel that in meetings, right? What if I say the wrong thing? What if people think I'm dumb? Um, we say, you know, sense of control is when you don't feel like you really have any ability to change the situation. So if you've been in, like, let's say, like a rideshare car and maybe the driver is driving a little bit erratically, it can be very stressful because you can't really control the situation. You can maybe mention to the driver, please drive a little bit slower or whatnot, but you don't have the same sense of control if maybe you were driving the car. So for me, for example, um, I can use the example of giving this talk. Okay? Right now, my two elements are threat to the ego and sense of control. I've given talks before, and unless the hurricane arrives earlier and much stronger than expected, I'm not really having anything too unpredictable happen. But I have threat to my ego, because I do genuinely worry that maybe all of you looking out there on me think that maybe me and my talk are trivial. Maybe you're reading this and being like, I know all this already. Why are you talking to me about this stuff? And that gives me some stress. Uh, it talks about my competence as a person, and that makes me worried. I also can't really do much about that, which affects my sense of control. So I can't really do much more than present what I have. Um, so I can pinpoint exactly what's going on. So now let's do a quick exercise. I want all of you to think of the last time 
you were stressed, okay? I'll give you, we're gonna do a full minute. I will look at my laptop clock to make sure that we get that full time for you. And then I want you to try to see which of these four maybe were related, okay? All right, so maybe another 20, 30 seconds for this. OK, um, how many of you were able to pinpoint from your last stress some, one of these ingredients? Oh, nice. Yes, so it's a really helpful exercise because I find now when I'm stressed, I sit there and go through which of these they are because then we can have some idea of kind of how to rectify the situation. Uh, also, while I was doing this research, a really fun fact from the Center for Studies on Human Stress. Uh, when we are stressed, we enter fight or flight mode and our bodies build up extra energy to allow us to do either. However, uh, this was kind of something that was built historically and we're rarely now attacked by saber-toothed tigers. Uh, so I'm stressed about delivering this talk, but I'm assuming safely that none of you are saber-toothed tigers. Uh, but I still have all this pent-up energy left and that can make me irritable or aggravated. So the solution is actually to expend that energy. And so next time you're feeling stress and entering that fight or flight, go walk a few flight of stairs to release that energy and it'll pull you out of that mode. And through physio uh, physiology, we can figure out how to kind of handle the situations we're in. So burnout, stress leads to burnout. And there are actually common factors for burnout. I hope the thing that kind of like will be underlined here is that a lot of the things that we think happen and we're not sure why, well, there's actually research behind that. We can actually pinpoint to things that give us reasons for this. So the six common factors for burnout are work overload, lack of control, insufficient rewards, breakdown of community, absence of fairness, and value conflicts. And many of these have threads to our sense of the world we live in and our ability to be seen, heard, and play a role within it. So we can actually start mapping these back to the ingredients for stress and especially threat to ego and sense of control. And what happens when we start burning out? Well, we start feeling exhausted, we start getting very cynical, and we start being ineffective. And I think that the thing that we realize is that no one wants these feelings, right? Most people want to do a good job. They don't want to feel burnt out. They don't want to feel exhausted. They don't want to be cynical. And burnout affects our job satisfaction, which then ties into performance. And so you can see there, that's the bottom quote, personal well-being significantly predicted not only the employee performance, but also subsequent performances years in the future. That's why this stuff matters. It has long-term, it has a long tail on it. And if you need a number to add to it, one study suggests that work-related stress and burnout costs the American economy an estimated $300 billion in lost productivity a year. So how do we normally talk about de-stressing, right? Now I've just like depressed all of you with all of this conversation about how stressed we are and the ingredients for it and how we're all burnt out. So go on a vacation, right? That's what you do. You're feeling stressed out, go on a vacation, you're good. Um, do some mindfulness, some meditation. You know, I have headspace, I do it every single day. I'm reading a lot of books on mindfulness. Um, exercise. So I rock climb, I uh, run, I do this to try to, you know, get some of the, that extra energy out of my system. Uh, do controlled breathing. There was a whole New York Times article on how to breathe properly. You can actually breathe, you're supposed to do four beats in, 
pause, then four beats out. And if you do that for about a minute, it resets our physiological system. Uh, and so because of the way that we're also stressed, we actually do very shallow breathing. So if you start doing controlled breathing, it actually has a lot of benefits. Uh, sleep better. So you know, we all know we don't sleep enough. We don't get good enough sleep. We are you know, cradling our phones, and all the blue light is bad for us. OK, so vacation, mindfulness, meditation, exercise, control breathing, sleep better. Uh, and then therapy. You know, I've been in therapy. I find it extremely useful. Uh, so these are all things that we do when we talk about de-stressing. Uh, I would add a few as well, like listening to Beyonce. I think that's very de-stressing. I do that very often. Um, and also having pets. This is my dog, Taco. And looking at him immediately melts away my stress. Yes, take pictures of, of this slide. This is a very important one. Now, the thing about this, though, is that this is all, this is what I talked about in my email as well. I was like, oh, here's some ways to prevent burnout. But the problem is that it's, there's more to the story. Those are all things that we can do. And this quote uh, really stuck with me, this one up here. Many workplaces have opted for attempting to enhance their workers' resilience rather than modifying risk factors. OK, think about this for a second. So reflect on your attempts at resilience. All the vacations you took, all the mindfulness exercises, the controlled breathing, all the Beyonce you listened to. And did you internalize the idea that if things are going wrong, it's probably your fault? Or wholly within your control to fix? Because we like that as human beings. We like the idea of control. We want to feel like we can control everything. Uh, and so that gets to the second quote, which is, research shows that situational and organizational factors play more of a role in the workplace than individual ones. So of course, do the individual things. But we're actually missing a lot of the picture here. But we focus on the individual because of our ideas of individual causality and responsibility. In addition to the assumption that it's easier and cheaper to change people rather than organizations. So I remember that it kind of chilled me to the bone because it kind of read my mind. You know, how many of us assume that we should not think at a team or organizational level because why bother? But what this research says to us is that we have to widen our scope to truly understand and affect the system we live in. And so what are some of these situational and organizational factors? So here's a model for looking at the three main ones related to job-related stress. And importantly, how they interrelate. So these are not isolated, OK? You've got uh, occupational uncertainty. This is the idea of, for a lot of people, especially who are doing part-time work or gig economy work, does my job, is it secure? You know, what might change in my role? Um, definitely all of us have probably faced organizational change. What happens when there's a reorg? How does that affect me? OK, there's imbalanced job design. So what happens when our working hours are all over the place? Right? If you're on call, you may not know exactly when you're going to be working. That's very stressful. The job demands that we have. Are we getting rewarded for the effort that we're doing? And the last one is lack of value and respect in the workplace. Do we feel like it's fair? Humans have a very, very strong sense of fairness. And if we do not feel like the workplace that we're in is fair, it deeply stresses us out. And so what this says is that uh, how a job and how work culture are designed, whether intentional or not, directly has a role in work-related stress. And we can't keep relying on individuals to do all the heavy lifting. So now let's go back to this burnout slide, because now we can put this picture together. We can start seeing how imbalanced job design, occupational uncertainty, lack of value and respect in the workplace can then lead to the common factors that are leading to burnout. Right? This is starting to look like a system. This is starting to look like a process. These are all things that I think many of you would be familiar with. Now, the stakes become even higher all right? when we realize that researchers believe that emotions are contagious. So we have to look from an individual level to a group level. And that like catching a cold as social animals, we tend to catch the emotions of people around us. And the effect appears higher between a manager and a report. That's why those arrows are bolded. And this rings true, right? Because we've had leaders who inspired us so they can affect us. We can be contagious from their inspiration. And we've had leaders who've demotivated us. 
We can tell that they don't necessarily care or they're too stressed to see us, and we feel that. And the amplified effect is probably explained by the fact that they're directly influencing what our job means and what our sense of self means then. Uh, and so we can actually go back to two slides ago and start seeing how then we can understand this idea of emotional contagion and how, why it matters on a group level. And at the same time, though, luckily, this works for all emotions, for happy and sad. So that's a silver lining. So negative emotions can lower morale and productivity, but positive emotions can have benefits such as improving employee cooperation, satisfaction, and performance. See, this talk isn't all doom and gloom. And one model for emotional contagion, thank you, uh, it looks at three factors, interpersonal factors, so trust between people. Uh, and this is from person to person, right? Uh, rather than on a group level. Individual factors, so we talked about empathy or how you absorb uh, the things that happen to you. And contextual factors, which looks at leadership and job design. And these all contribute to the level of emotional contagion, which then affects team effectiveness. All right, so that is a lot of information, OK, within a very short span of time. Uh, to do a quick summary before we get into these, uh, looking at it from an SRE perspective, we've talked about the factors in stress. We've talked about the ingredients of stress. We've talked about how it affects burnout. We've talked about it, how there's an individual, a, a team, and there's an organizational level, how often teams and organizational factors play a larger role, how um, as a group, we can actually infect one another with our uh, emotions, and how then we have to look at this from a systemic point of view. All right, so now this is a thought exercise, OK? I'm going to be very honest with you that this is not stuff that's been put into practice. The whole point of this talk is to get us thinking about what might we do and how might we do this. So I need all of your help to be imaginative and creative, and maybe take some of this stuff and apply it and see what works. Uh, but we're going to try to approach mental health as if we had the philosophy that we're doing with SRE. So how can we think about our monitoring? So how often do you get pulled for your feedback? I know many companies tend to do surveys that talk about you know, job satisfaction. Do you, can you get your work done? So how many people at your organization get feedback at least once a year? OK, you have a survey at least once a year. OK, that makes sense, worrying that some of you don't have your hands up. Uh, how many of you get polled twice a year? So maybe it's every, great. Uh, maybe quarterly, four times a year. OK, let's keep going. Eight times a year. Yeah? Oh, this is actually kind of nice. Maybe monthly, 12 times a year? Awesome. Uh, let's just stop there, because I think the, the hands keep diminishing. Uh, what if? What do you know about your well-being climate if you're not having these feedback tools, right? What if we monitored systems monthly like we do our people? Could you do your job effectively if you only got a snapshot once a month for it? How would you know how things are doing acutely versus long term? How would you know the levels of psychological safety and how those change over time? How blame aware is your company? We talk about this all the time. I see article after article about creating blame aware cultures. But we talk about it, and then do we have the feedback tools so we understand what we can do to actually impact that? So then it got me thinking about golden signals. OK, so we all know the four golden signals for SRE, right? Latency, saturation, traffic, error. And then we like repeat this over and over again. And everyone's like, yes, 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 four golden signals. What if? We start to think about the four golden signals. Could there be four golden signals for burnout? Could we start asking people about cynicism and emotional exhaustion and chronic negative responses and ineffectiveness? And can we monitor that so we have an idea about if people are starting to feel burnt out? Maybe even in the process of talking about it, we can start getting people to think about it and start trying to solve it. Instead, we kind of wait for our systems to fail before we do anything about it. We wait until people burn out. And then they leave, and they go on vacation, and they do mindfulness, and they do all these things. And we go, ah, there we go. Now we solved it. But I don't think that would actually work for like the other day-to-day -day work that you do, right? to just let your systems fail first. And they're like, well, now we'll let them recover. Now, I'm not saying these are the four golden s signals. But we can start thinking about this and seeing 
what we can answer by checking for these things. What if we start using SLIs and SLOs? All right. What if, what are the indicators? Maybe we look at job satisfaction. We know job satisfaction directly ties to organizational performance. Right? If any of you have read Accelerate, there's a you know, schematic where they directly say that, and there's lots of studies to back that up. So if we take this idea that Google says about SLOs as, a, oh, I have five minutes, okay, as approximately where customers are happy, what would that mean for job satisfaction, right? What level then will we find acceptable around job satisfaction? When are we failing our customers or our employees? At what point do they stop being customers, right? We say that sometimes if you don't meet your, SLO, or your SLOs and your SLAs, people will leave the platform. Don't people do that as well when they go on leave or they leave the company? So this might seem a bit caustic to treat people in the same way, and I really don't mean it to be. But I'm wondering that if we have metrics that we've intentionally set, wouldn't it follow that we, did, we would then design our roles to meet those metrics? And if we don't have metrics, then what does that say about our intentionality around our roles? We can return to this slide. Maybe there's things here that we can measure, right? Maybe you can start looking at these things. Every company is different. And here's the tough part. People in your organization need to figure out what is relevant to your organization. I really wish I could be like, here, just do this one survey. You'll have all the answers. You can fix everything. But you can't even do that with all the other processes that we do, right? You can't just have this blank template and hope that it works. But here's the plus side. With all this stuff, we actually now know what we can start measuring. I think that's really important. So let's dive even more role specific. Let's try to tackle the idea of improper job design. This is sort of what the earliest speakers were talking about, right? How can you build tooling to make people's roles better? So let's look at Toil. We can actually look at Kurt's talk from Lisa 2018 entitled, How Bad Is Your Toil? Where he discusses running surveys in order to measure the human impact of process. There are some of the, here's one of the survey questions that he did, asking participants in the last month to give an estimate of how much time was spent in each of the categories of, say, software engineering versus reactive work or overhead. You know, we've heard that if you have too much toil, it can lead to burnout, it can lead to job dissatisfaction. Are you asking those questions? Are there surveys around this stuff? And with all of the time, oh, then you answer all the time, you total it up to 100%. And based on the surveys, LinkedIn was able to spot where they could create tooling to help alleviate toil. So I'd really recommend watching the talk. Again, that's uh, Kurt Anderson, Lisa 2018. What about on-call and incident response? What could we do there? So uh, a while ago, I did a straw poll where I asked people about their stress indicators after an incident. Okay, We know that when people are stressed, they have less ability to fall asleep, that they have less ability to concentrate, they have change in mood, they have, um, we look at their desire to be social, we look at their ability to enjoy things, and the orange bars there are worse or less than usual. And my favorite thing is always change in appetite doesn't have a change. I love that, that people are just like, I'm stressed, but I'm still gonna eat exactly as much as I normally eat. I'm not gonna change that. But everything else had much worse uh, indicators. Are we checking for this? You know, this is not actually difficult to do, to ask people after an incident, are you feeling these things? Then what can we do to fix them, right? You have to ask that first question to get to the second part. We can then go back to our recipe for stress. We can look at the four ingredients that we had, novelty, unpredictability, threat to ego, and sense of control, and maybe we start doing a, an exercise where we go, okay, was the incident novel? If it was, how was it novel? How could we have made it not new? So maybe we could say game days would have made this incident not feel new to me. I would have had a little bit more experience with it. Um, maybe they'll say I didn't feel control over the incident because I didn't know who to page when. Maybe it was 3 in the morning and I really didn't want to wake up one of my coworkers if this wasn't that serious. I didn't know what to do. I tried to do it by myself. That really stressed me out. Now you have something that you can actually start fixing. Now, the problem is we have a bit of hero syndrome in our industry. Everyone wants to be a hero. Everyone wants to be the one who solved the problem and didn't have anyone else, you know, didn't need to have anyone else rely on them. The problem is multiple studies have found people who are less likely to discuss their emotional state are more emotionally contagious. So, for example, in studies, because women tend to be more open about their emotional state, they tend to be less emotionally contagious around negative feelings. And so this is something that we have to then watch out for. We can start bundling this. If we're having 
burnout and negative emotions, but then we know this group contagion, but then we also worry that we can't talk about this, we're actually exacerbating the problem. And so this is why we're all sitting here to talk about this so we can make this better. So at the end of the day, um, I was thinking about Nancy's talk. You know, she talks about an accident, and she defines it as a loss or any undesired or un unplanned event that results in a loss. And I'd say that the negative impact on our well-being of our coworkers and ourselves falls under that. I think burnout might, file, uh, might fit into an accident that's undesired and hopefully unplanned, and certainly it's a loss. So what I'm asking is not easy. You know, you can't, but you can't change what you can't see, and you can't see what you're not monitoring. And it's a little easier once we start knowing what we're looking for. And again, just to leave on the note that this is not all just about the negatives. I know a lot of this talk talked about the negative emotions, but this is also where we can try to build the positive emotions. Let's look at happiness and positive well-being and job satisfaction, and let's get this moving in the other way. Let's turn this from a vicious cycle into a virtuous one. All right, so this is my goodbye slide. All right, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed my time. I have some fond memories from this. Um, in all seriousness, your well-being and mental health matter. Okay, we can figure out how to intentionally create positive effects. Let's build systems that include people. Thank you so much. Say hello. There's my email address. And if you want more Beyonce or Taco, you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, we have time for two quick questions. Oh, there's one in the back. I'll try to get to, I saw that one first, so I'm gonna head there. I'm acutely aware that I'm stopping people from going to lunch. Do you think that a blameless post-mortem culture will fully remove the threat to the ego or will it just substantially diminish it? Uh, I think that it really depends on you know, not to use the buzzword, but how blame aware a company actually is, right? We're looking at psychological safety. We're looking at the trust that people feel with one another, their ability to express ideas without feeling they're gonna be attacked or reprimanded for it. Mm -hmm. And I think those are like, those feeds into those ingredients. I think that having a, there's a lot of conversation around groupthink during postmortems and how people can end up not saying the thing they're really feeling because they might be embarrassed to go against other people. And so that's really about corporate culture. Can you create a way that people don't feel that threat to ego or that uh, sense of um, you know, being uh, harmed for saying something about themselves or not feeling that they're gonna be seen as stupid? And then that actually allows for, I think it's a great tool if you can manage that. I saw one more raised hand in the middle as I was walking past. There we go. So uh, computer systems are not getting annoyed when someone asks about their state too often. How do you make sure that uh, people will not feel uh, bad about your, your doing that too often? I think we have to talk about the incentives, right? Why are we doing this? I think that we all get annoyed, even um, being pinged once for something that we don't think is valuable is one time too many. So I think that this is not a case where we say, okay, well, what if we um, annoy people too much with, with how they're feeling? I don't know about you, but most people love talking about themselves. They actually really enjoy discussing how they're feeling if they feel like the other person's actually listening to what they're saying. So that, I think, is the key there. If you can make people feel like that is actuated, then they won't mind being you know, repeatedly asked these things. However, if it feels like it's just a shadow exercise, if it feels like it's just being done to placate people, then it is actually even worse because it feels insulting because you've taken people's time, you've asked them to be vulnerable, and you did nothing about it. So I think you have to get a little bit of stakeholder uh, buy-in to say, okay, let's actually try to act on these results. Otherwise, I agree with you. You don't want to overdo this. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you so much for staying. Enjoy lunch. <laughs> <laughs>